I'm going to say that anyone who was sufficiently motivated to gain access to some computer or network somewhere, if their motivation is high enough, I feel that they can accomplish whatever it is that they need to accomplish, however long it may take them. And the victims may never know. With your name and your social security number, and the right access to either a computer wire or a credit reporting facility, it's a key to open up a rather private part of your life. Computers are today's bank vaults. Criminal hackers have attempted spectacular robberies like breaking into Russia's central bank computers to steal $57 million. Money and secrets can be accessed down a phone line. But killing by keystroke is also possible. In Vermont, uh, a couple of years ago, an entire town, every single person within that single town, was listed as a tax deadbeat and was listed on their credit reports. Now, there was a computer error in that case. But that error, that single keystroke that affected an entire town could have just as easily been an intentional one. In West Hartford, Connecticut, every single person in the town was listed as dead. And the only reason they discovered it was because nobody from West Hartford was being called up on jury duty. So these are kind of humorous. But the point is, a single keystroke can literally kill somebody electronically. Personal information is no longer locked away in a filing cabinet. It's stored on computers at home and work. And hackers show how easy it is to gain unauthorized access into someone's account by using their login and password. Here we are. We're in. Now, uh, normally I, would, I might just use this for a free access to jump to some other place. But if this was the first time I was using this account, I might just, uh, read this guy's mail. Any embarrassing correspondence or detail of this person's life is now at the mercy of the hackers. Let's see if he has anything interesting here. Uh, well, this is interesting. Uh, got something called sexware.arc. Who knows what that might be? Uh, Maybe we oughtn't go into it. Uh, no. Uh, though at, if I chose to, I can now transfer this file to me, uh, though uh, I have much more high priorities than sexual uh, arousal. Okay, uh, he, he, he does have his mail stored in here, so if I wished I could read it all, all the past mail that has been saved. Nothing was stolen, altered, or destroyed. But even if hackers have no criminal intent, what they do is illegal. Breaking into computers without permission is a criminal act. Using a modem, a device that links a computer to a phone line, information can be sent and received and users can connect to the internet, a vast international network linking millions of computers. With a valid account, huge libraries of information become accessible and mail can be sent electronically anywhere in the world to hundreds of people simultaneously. In one instance, a heart attack victim's life was saved because he was able to tap out an SOS message when he collapsed at his desk. 35 million people now use the internet and it's rapidly growing every month. But so are attacks on the network as hackers use it to break into other computer sites. Unlike traditional crimes such as drug smuggling, gathering evidence is more difficult for law enforcement. A hacker can pick up the phone and dial a local university and then go out on the internet, download a file and hang up. None of those traditional checkpoints like borders exist. You don't need large amounts of people. You don't need vehicles for conveyance. You don't have to manipulate money. One of the things about the internet is it's global. It's in 60 plus countries with millions of users. And unlike traditional offenses, which give opportunities for law enforcement, a hacker case doesn't yield the same opportunities. The recent events that occurred on the internet with the break-ins and the compromise of thousands of passwords uh, shows how simple it is. And those, that was just done by allegedly a couple of kids. And good evening to one and all. This is Emmanuel Goldstein. The program is off the hook.
And we come here Emmanuel Goldstein runs a hacker radio show in New York. Guru to the cyberpunks, he argues they're not criminals, just explorers in cyberspace, pushing back the electronic frontiers of knowledge. This is incredible. We're on the internet at the same time that uh, we're on the radio. And uh, the internet is this amazing meeting place of the minds that can take place over continents. It can take place over time. It can take place over space and energy and anything else you can think of. And that's where we are tonight. On this occasion, the internet was legally accessed and the use of the phone was paid for. But usually, hackers need free, anonymous phone lines to get into other systems around the world without being traced. This brings them into conflict with the telephone companies who track their activities. Telco detective Dale Drew maintains a hacker vigil. Here's a picture of Emmanuel Goldstein, uh, who was at SummerCon 1993. Uh, I've had people going into almost every database you, you, you can think of looking for my personal information. So I've gone to great extents to try to protect myself. Uh, you know, but when you have uh, 23,000 computer hackers who really you know, would, would, like, would like to meet you in a dark alley with a baseball bat, you know, it's pretty hard to keep tucked away from everybody. He searches for messages and clues left by hackers about possible intrusions into his own company, MCI Data Network. These are often left on computer bulletin board systems, or BBSs, where information is shared about the latest systems cracked and how it was done. Sometimes legitimate bulletin boards are used as fronts for the hacker community, where innocuous messages contain hidden meanings. We'll log into a BBS, download all the messages, and then if we find a hacker talking about either who has already gained access into that system, you know, that, that, that customer, or is trying to get access to that customer, we, we will alert that customer to saying, hey, look, we, we found a couple of computer hackers in Germany or Switzerland or in New York talking about your particular computer system, and here's what we found. You may want to take steps to have that system protected. Okay, it's got the phones. Good evening, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. I was arrested for PBXing. PBXing, meaning uh, using a uh, company's phone system to make free phone calls. Is that the definition? Yes. Okay. A friend of mine is carding phone phone cards. Phone cards. That is making telephone calls with calling card numbers. Yes, and he's trying. He tells me that it's safe. Is this true? No. 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 Anytime you commit a crime, it's not safe. It's something you got to remember and. Uh, when you do things like that, it's committing a crime. It's very simple to realize that. That's, uh, you know, using a system and not paying for the service is something that someone's going to get angry about. It's very simple. Experimenting with a system, though, and, and figuring out ways to make it do different things, it's a bit more nebulous. Someone's still going to get angry, but is it technically breaking the law? Who's to say? But uh, at least recognize that there is a risk involved. John Delaney's worked phone crimes for the past decade. To him, hacking is just another crime, like breaking into someone's house. But the teenage cyberpunks don't worry him. He's after organized criminals who exploit hacking techniques. Telephone fraud in New York alone runs into hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Call cell rackets use stolen PBX codes to offer cheap international calls on public payphones. Many codes are obtained from hacking, but it's an activity most hackers despise. Today, Delaney is tracking a street corner enterprise in Harlem. One of the ways you recognize those call cell operations on the corner is you, when you watch a guy, he hits about 30 different numbers and he's going out through somebody's PBX. They always carry the telephone number on a piece of paper that they want dialed and they give it to the person to dial it for them. The person initiates the call either using the stolen uh, telephone credit card number or the remote access code through the PBX that they're going to utilize. The hackers seem to have the same kind of moral sense. They know where the line is, they don't cross it. They don't uh, hurt things, they don't damage things. Now, that's not to say there aren't people that can do this. There are criminals that can use hacker abilities. Some of the skills developed are ripe for crime. These hackers are creating credit card numbers which could be used to commit a fraud. Now, what this allows me to do is generate a card that appears to come from one of these banks. And I search for the keyword Arizona. And there it is, City Bank of Arizona. Prefix is 5234. And I type that in and it asks me how many cards I'd like to generate. Just for this, I'll generate 10. 
And there it is. Using a mathematical algorithm, I have generated 10 cards that appear to be coming from the Citibank in Arizona, and they fit the mathematical algorithm that would say that they're a real card. Um, you could gain access to one of the major credit bureaus here in America, CBI, TRW, Equifax, etc., and use these cards to verify that, in fact, they have a certain limit, that they were, in fact, issued. And if they were, you could successfully commit credit card fraud. These hackers claim they do this merely to crack codes and break systems. But in the wrong hands, fraudulent card numbers could then be used to purchase expensive goods over the phone. Uh, however, again, this is just an interesting program, and if you're stupid enough to, uh, you know, w want to order merchandise and deliver it to your house, you know, go right ahead. It's not my fault. Other than the money that you have in your pocket, everything that you own, all of your money, is electronic. It's a series of bits, ones and zeros, strung together in computers. And if I want to go after money, I'm going to go after that. It's a crime without clues, and it takes months before a victim realizes they've been stung. New York lawyer Harvey Horowitz. The feeling of being financially violated, being this exposed to anyone, was, was a rather unsettling experience. Someone has my social security number. With that, uh, someone else accesses my, my um, credit history. The history is produced with a listing of all my credit cards and the credit card numbers. The credit card companies are then called. The person identifies themselves as me, has the address changed for billing purposes. Then either uh, orders a duplicate card sent to the new address or proceeds to um, uh, charge up merchandise either through the phone or through the mail. Uh, it's charged to my account, but the bills are sent to this bogus address. A checkbook was also sent to this bogus address and $9,000 stolen from his account. The criminals obtained his financial details by accessing a credit reporting agency using a computer at the car sales company where they worked. A criminal ring had infiltrated the company and 15 former salesmen now face fraud charges for illegally using computers to steal credit information. There were 3,000 victims. They lost $25 million. None of them had ever bought a car there. The scale and simplicity of the scam amazed the police investigator, Detective Judd Levinson. With one little number, your social security number, these people can obtain everything that they need to know about a person, all right? Private information that you feel is safe and secure, all right, with one minute on a computer will all become, you know, total open knowledge for their use. And this is knowledge that they will have and use forever. I suppose 20 years ago, if someone wanted to get my social security number, they'd almost have to literally uh, break into a file cabinet and then flip through. Now, because the social security number appears on so many uh, databases, uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles Bureau has it, the, the company that sends out my uh, um, uh, rent bill every month has it. In many states in this uh, country, even your driver's license number is now your social security number, and it's one number that even if other people use it, all right, you cannot replace it. It always remains as your one number and it cannot be altered or changed legally by the government. The credit profiles not only list your name, address, your, your most recent addresses, your date of birth, but they actually have, uh, if not all, they have the most significant digits of your credit cards so that the actual credit card number can be ascertained from your credit profile. Once I have your electronic identity, I can go out and get money, get loans, purchase things in your name, take the goods, take the cash, and you will end up holding the bag, having to pay the bills. Hey, speaking of fun, speaking of um, dangers to our individual liberty, you know, I went out this week and I bought a six-pack of beer. Yeah. Well, I don't do that very often. It's kind of a big event when I do. And so the person said, can you prove you're 21? And I said, yeah, sure. Ask me a question about the 60s or something. But uh, th th that wasn't good enough. They wanted to see my license. So I gave them my license. I figured they'd just look at the license and see that I was over 21 and put it back. But no, you know what they did? They took my license and they entered numbers from it. They entered numbers from my license into their computer. So somewhere there is a record of me buying beer in this particular supermarket's computer. And who knows what other computers that computer talks to. That's scary. I mean, I don't want people to know if I'm drinking Pepsi. I don't want people to know anything. 
just want to be left alone. I want to be, uh, you know, private. Private, solitary citizen. That's all we offer hope for. So, anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's what's happening uh, out there in the scary world. operate a night shift vigil in their twilight world. It's a solitary pastime. They rarely meet face to face, but the digital underground is one huge swap shop where hackers strut their stuff and boast of their latest exploits. Secret bulletin boards are used to post details of their latest hacks and newest techniques. Cyberspace is their electronic cafe. Here in New York, of course, you can uh, meet a bunch of hackers by um, going down to the uh, City Core Center on Friday afternoon at uh, 5 p.m. and hanging out until around 8 p.m. and you'll, uh, you'll meet all kinds of strange and interesting people. This bizarre gathering of techno-dweebs is the 2600 Club, named after the tones used in the early days to get free phone calls. This activity is known as freaking. 2600 supporters meet throughout the world. Clustering around the payphones, they bait the authorities in a show of defiance, but stopping short of breaking the law. There's no crimes going on here. We're here exchanging information. Hacking is the quest for knowledge. Uh, it's a quest that makes people in charge of knowledge rather uneasy because sometimes they know things that we don't know yet. But this isn't a view shared by law enforcement. We've had some significant cases like the Masters of Deception in New York and the Legion of Doom in Atlanta where hackers have penetrated the phone company computers and altered phone services and tampered with their computers. We have to prosecute cases like that. The phone system is integral to American life. We have to make sure that the system's protected, available, and functioning properly. The thing is, hackers don't make very good criminals. When we find something, we usually tell everybody we know. And that's why so many of us always get caught doing something that the government considers to be illegal. One convicted hacker was a former member of the Masters of Deception, Mark Abeni, alias Fiber Optic. Notorious for his hacking expertise and alleged ability to take control of telephone networks, he became a key target for law enforcement. You a criminal? Definitely not. <laughs> Although, um... I think uh, a lot of the companies involved in the case were some pretty big multinational corporations and would have liked to see some bad things happen to me. And the judge made sure that that happened. A high-profile prosecution by the FBI and Secret Service led to a year's jail term after he admitted breaking into telephone and corporate computers. He didn't do anything wrong, he didn't steal anything, he didn't rip anybody off, he didn't cause any damage. Yet, the government feels it's right to put somebody like that away. That's a scary thing and something that I hope we never forget. Abeni's ability to trace and tap phone calls led to his prosecution, a clear warning to the hacker community. As a child, he had an amazing capacity to memorize huge amounts of data. He began hacking age 12 and was forced to leave one of his schools after breaking into the grades computer. Breaking into a house, it's pretty clear-cut what it is that's being done and usually what the motivation is. With computer trespass, it gets a little more complicated. There's all sorts of motivations and intentions and reasons behind why someone would do that. And there is no one reason across the board why someone would be involved in something like computer trespass. They prosecuted Mark because Mark had the answers, because Mark would tell people how things worked. They didn't prosecute the people that actually caused damage. To them, that's not a threat. The threat is giving out knowledge, is explaining how systems work, explaining vulnerabilities. They fear us because we oftentimes understand a lot more about their computers and their networks than they themselves do. And they feel threatened by this. 
because they don't understand us and they don't know what it is that we're capable of doing. Every country has its own way of dealing with computers, but there's always this group of people there somewhere that's trying to figure it all out, that's trying to hack the phone system. What happens if you dial this number? What happens if you dial that number? If you punch this key at this particular moment in time, if we start making it so people are afraid to do that, no one's going to discover anything. Alert. Repeated login failures for user. Alert. Repeated login failures for user. So each investigator automatically and in real time gets an alert on their screen plus plus a voice activation of when someone's hacking into their system. And on the screen it tells you what kind of error message it was, what port it was, coming from what system, and what username that they were using when, when the hacking occurred. Now the system I just tried to hack into is in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And it took about one second for that data to come over here. Dale Drew helped prepare the case against Mark Abeni. He's a master of detection, but he's afraid that the skills of someone like Abeni can be used and abused by anyone. So you have the hackers who are the elite of the elite who hack into corporate America and then write computer scripts for the not-so-elite computer hackers. So you have the 23,000 computer hackers within, within the, the U.S. being able to gain access into corporate America the exact same way that, that, that the elite of the elite computer hackers do. So it would be as if a 14-year-old child using the, 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 most, the most simplistic and cheapest hardware available would have the same access to your computer system as the same people who designed it. People target whatever seems the most unreachable. People here target military systems because they say military systems can't possibly be breached. And if they can't be, what's the harm? If they can be, then we'd better start breaching them to figure out how they can be breached. I'd much rather have a hacker do it than, than some enemy agent. Only recently, the CIA thought it had snared a super spy attempting to steal blueprints for the latest military weapons systems. Ship designs and ballistic missile research were compromised when internet raiders broke into the Pentagon's defense computers. They copied and erased records, took control of several sites, and in some cases, shut them down. One million passwords had been stolen. A 16-year-old British hacker has now been arrested. I'm going to examine a military site. Typically, it's not a good idea to try to break into a system while people are using the system. But in this case, I'm going to use a little bit of a backdoor method that allows me access to the files without actually alerting the users in the system. A good system administrator would not allow this kind of access to happen, especially in military sites and government sites. The administrators are not very technically skilled. They're, they're under enormous time pressures. They don't have proper training to know what to do in these kind of situations. I've now, in essence, taken their hard disk on the remote system and placed it in my local system. Now I can access any of their files. Anyone who has accessed the internet can access these files. There are so many military sites on the internet and uh, it only takes one small weakness to compromise the, any given site. And so while there are a lot of military sites, many of them are probably fairly secure, uh, nonetheless there are potentials for lots of break-ins. Dan Farmer's job is to make his own company's system secure. Based in Silicon Valley, he's an international expert on hacking. People aren't aware of how easy it is to gain access to systems. They aren't aware of how easy it is to gain access to information that's kept on systems. And uh, pretty much anything that's run on a company level, uh, whether it be financial records, uh, new plans for new products, uh, personnel files, anything of this sort, is, is fairly easily accessed over the internet and, and is done so on a daily basis by uh, interlopers or intruders. Every company on the internet of any size whatsoever has been attacked and has probably been broken into. And if they think they haven't been broken into, the odds are that they just don't know that they've been broken into. Corporate America is afraid to publicly admit there is a problem. Companies often refuse to report computer break-ins to the police but it's known computer crime costs business an estimated three billion dollars a year. Most organized crime is after money and they're gonna 
use whatever techniques that they have at their disposal to go after those. We see here in the United States, oft times, ATM machines, the subject of attack. Some people drive a pickup truck up to an ATM machine, wrap a chain around it, yank it off its pedestal, and take it apart and get the money out of it. The electronic criminal would rather do it in a more sophisticated manner. Financial experts Price Waterhouse run their own team of legal hackers to protect some of the most sensitive corporate and government computer systems in the USA. The purpose of a hacker study is to um, test a client's uh, susceptibility to a hacker attack from both uh, an outside hacker, uh, the people you read about in the papers, uh, teenagers, people in their basement, and an inside hacker, which could be a disgruntled employee or uh, even a trusted employee who, for whatever reason, has a decided he might like to uh, try to get some more access to a system for financial or other type of gain. We have a software tool known as a demon dialer and what that does is it dials every possible phone number in a given exchange. If it hears a computer tone it logs that phone number for us and then we can go back and we'll try to make a connection to those numbers and see if we can find our clients computers. And what we'll try to do at the second level is to actually break into the computer, either by guessing a password, stealing a password, somehow circumventing whatever control or security mechanisms that have been put in place. And we have a number of tools that help us to do that. Um, we have a password guesser, which is a program that takes uh, an English language dictionary and attempts to use every word in that dictionary as a password, uh, hopefully finding one that works. Um, we also have a password cracker, which will take uh, a password file that has been encrypted and attempt to decrypt it um, to obtain a password. The team uses techniques and programs obtained from the hacker community itself and have never failed to break into a client's computers. When banks are broken into, for instance, they will almost never report it because the, the stigma of being broken into for a bank is, is much greater than the, uh, the financial loss that they'll uh, incur as, as a result of this. And the same kind of things with uh, large corporations when, when they have something very important stolen. They'd much rather just take the loss and, and the financial loss than to admit to the public that, yes, we, we've, we've allowed all your, your, your tax dollars, your stock dollars to go away uh, because we weren't watching the back doors. A few years ago, the Bank of New York, at the end of the day, tallied up their books. And they discovered that they were $23 billion short, gone. They could not find what had happened to it. That evening, they brought in their experts and found a one-line error in the code of the software programs that ran the transactions. So what do they do for $23 billion? They have to go to the Federal Reserve System to borrow the money, balance the books, pay the interest the following day, and straighten everything out. If a similar type of error, either accidentally or purposefully occurred to the Federal Reserve System, where are we going to borrow a trillion dollars for an overnight repair? That is one of the biggest threats that exists to the Federal Reserve today. But there is another threat. The Federal Reserve has a network of computers throughout the USA linked to all the major banks. In New York alone, these networks monitor three million financial transactions a day. For somebody who wanted to disrupt the financial system of the United States, the Federal Reserve System makes a very attractive target. Here in Culpeper, Virginia, 80 miles from Washington, is a secret communication center. The Culpeper location for the Federal Reserve Board is kind of like a bunker built into the side of a hill and apparently has a fair amount of physical security associated with it. Radiation-proof chambers underground house a gigantic vault which until recent a fortune in cash to be used to jumpstart the US economy in the aftermath of a nuclear war. But is it safe from a hacker attack. Uh, electronically, the Federal Reserve Board is very aware of the vulnerabilities not only to themselves but to financial institutions in general. Around the globe, there are 21 electronic networks through which $3 trillion move every day. Culpeper is also a nerve center for one of these key routes for the worldwide electronic transfer of money. These networks are now so vital to the economy, they make ideal targets for a terrorist hacker attack bent on destabilizing the government. Using a scanner device, he plans to pinpoint where illegal calls are coming from. Uh, get going then. Okay, we are in the area known as Jackson Heights. This is also known as Little Columbia. Uh, mostly a Colombian population here. It's the main redistribution 
of cocaine in the New York metropolitan area. This is also the main area for cellular phone fraud for the county of Queens. Drug dealers were the first to steal other people's cell phone ID codes. Innocent customers got billed for the calls, and most importantly, the police couldn't trace the dealer's transactions. This in turn spawned a new street industry worth one million dollars a day. There is a car here to the right with blacked out windows, as I predicted. Also one to the left of us. And you see the signal right here? is all the way up on the top of the screen. You're parked right next to the car that's got the cellular phone in. The scanner identifies the source and later undercover police officers will purchase a long distance call and then arrest the criminal ringleaders. The crooks also use scanners but for capturing ID codes during legitimate calls. Then, using computers, they clone their own phones. All of their calls will now be charged to the victim. Every call going out is illegal, is from a cloned phone. Believe me, there's not a legitimate cellular phone in this neighborhood. We have seized as many as 13 phones in a day, and every one of them was cloned. At night, when it gets dark on that block, it's very dangerous. There's been several murders there during the past year. In fact, one of the people that we arrested for cellular phone fraud uh, was shot and dumped on the Northern State Parkway out on Long Island. And we ended up investigating his homicide. That's what brought us back in here. The other customers who have uh, cellular phones are paying for the loss because the telephone companies are allow allowed to charge by tariff from the FCC 100% of fraud back to the other customers. So the customers are paying. One of those is New York businessman Theo Giocopodopoulos, whose code has been stolen eight times in the last five years. Uh, about a year ago, I received a telephone uh, bill at my office. It was about 150 to 180 pages big, and it was in excess of $20,000. And the most of these phone calls, they were made in about three or four days, and they were all in the, uh, South America, uh, countries like Colombia. He now changes his portable phone's ID code every month. I have to watch when I go, where do I make a phone call, who do I... Uh, where do I use the phone? I try not to use the phone under bridges. I try to use my phone only in places that I think that uh, I would not have a problem. Businessmen leaving work from Manhattan face a daily threat at the Brooklyn end of the Midtown Tunnel, where call cell operators wait with scanners ready to steal their ID codes. Another example of the criminal entrepreneur keen to exploit the computer industry. Silicon Valley in California makes state-of-the-art hardware to power the world's most profitable business. Computer chips are worth more than gold or cocaine to organized crime. Each chip can cost up to $900, and last year, $40 million worth were stolen from Silicon Valley alone. High-tech robbery detectives are investigating a spate of eight armed takeovers of company premises by gangsters and are witnessing more violence. To capture the criminals, they've set up elaborate sting operations. This one netted 13 criminals who were prosecuted and convicted after planning a $25 million heist. Police call them takeaway robberies, as most of the gangs are Asian. And much of the product ends up in Southeast Asia. Countries like Taiwan are desperate to obtain the latest technology from the United States, so few questions are asked about its origins. The chips are put into their own computers and then sold back to the States. We are still the biggest storehouse of inventions of advanced technology in the world, and people come after us. We are the king of the hill still at this point. We're a six and a half trillion dollar economy and we've got some good stuff. Other people want a piece of it. A small software company in Boulder, Colorado claims it's a victim of its own success. The company is helping to build the new information superhighway by exploiting sensitive data gathered by the U.S. government. Ellery Systems has developed a unique user-friendly program to commercially process the vast web of knowledge held on the internet. But the company claims this priceless software has been stolen by a former employee with the aid of a foreign power. Future of 
this country, indeed the future of, of all other countries as we go into the 21st century, is going to be determined in, in large part uh, by our ability to, to use the information that is available and information and knowledge that is created uh, to, uh, to competitive advantage. The critical source code which drives their program makes a pile of paper 10 inches high when printed out. Its value is impossible to estimate. The cost of, of developing that source code was uh, uh, you know, nearly a million dollars, very close. Uh, but that doesn't begin to, to, to describe what the, the real value is. Uh, the anticipated value of this kind of technology is uh, you know, measured in, in billions, in tens of billions, in hundreds of billions of, of dollars. We're talking about the, the, the lifeblood of this company. So when it was transferred over the internet by the former employee, a Chinese national, to a new company allegedly backed by the Chinese government, his colleagues felt betrayed. Initially, there was a, a very real sense of just shock, of, of not being able to, to believe that someone that, that uh, uh, we had worked so closely with and that who had worked so closely with us, that had been so much a part of our vision, of our dream, uh, could do something like this. There were people here who literally had tears streaming down their faces when they found that, that one of, of their colleagues, a, a trusted professional colleague and personal friend, uh, was uh, in fact stealing years of their very best work. Come on in, Andrew. A grand jury indictment asserts that Andrew Wong had bargained with a Chinese government official and company to get financial backing for a new venture while still employed by Ellery. He's accused of wire and computer fraud. His lawyer, David Lane. Andrew took nothing that was Ellery's property. He, he took nothing that Ellery has any proprietary interest in whatsoever. Andrew is not guilty of the charges. He also dismisses espionage allegations. The government has raised allegations of um, possible national security being involved here, which is rather odd in light of the fact that Andrew Wong is a Chinese national, uh, and I'm hard-pressed to believe that Ellery Systems or the United States government would allow a Chinese national to work on a project of any kind relating to American national security. Wong faces a possible 10 years jail sentence if found guilty. An electronic ankle bracelet will keep him under house arrest until his trial later this year. Stealing a technology, attempting to set up another company that would be funded by organs of another country, infiltrating American industry, establishing strategic relationships with other companies in that industry and funneling all of that back unfairly. No, that's not what, what capitalism is all about. That's what theft is, is all about. That's what espionage is all about. A recent report showed that nearly half of a sample 150 research and development companies in computer technology had been the victims of industrial espionage. It's claimed 20 to 30 foreign intelligence agencies are conducting operations against U.S. business. Some of the other techniques of the information warrior are so simple, so easy, most people are unprotected, and getting away with it is a crime, but it's also very simple. We know about what the French have been doing. The Israelis have been involved in it. The Germans have a, product, uh, a project called Rahab which goes after American and other industrialized or uh, technologically advanced societies' information. The Japanese are involved in it. Taiwan is involved in it. Seven, six, five. NASA has led the world in developing technology for the future. The white heat of its inventions forged a new technology and transformed industry in the process.
Its Cray computers are some of the most powerful in the world, containing huge amounts of scientific data which is commercially sensitive. NASA is also an essential part of the Internet, providing a gateway for other countries and continents. Once into their systems, it's possible to access military sites. But NASA is an attractive target for hackers as high security makes it more of a challenge. As a government installation, our problems tend to be uh, more focused on the scientific uh, area and uh, penetration of these systems. We don't have uh, sort of uh, commercial secrets necessarily that are, that are uh, stolen uh, or, uh, or stealable. But uh, we do have a large uh, amount of collaborative activity with industry. We take very great care to make sure that none of their information is, is, uh, is available to, uh, to be uh, stolen by, uh, by the community. I'm going to masquerade myself as a user on the remote machine. And now I'm going to try to log into the machine itself. If this succeeds, then I'll have successfully broken in. Bravo, I'm now logged into the remote NASA computer, as you can plainly see by the login banner. This hacker has developed a technique that allows him to take over the system. Right now, I can become any of the users. I actually own the machine. I control the password file. I control the horizontal and the vertical. I control everything about this machine. I can become any of these users. I can read any of their files. I can do anything I want on this machine. In addition from this machine, I can then go on to other NASA machines in other parts of the world. Access to this machine can be obtained by stealing the computer's address, user ID, and password. One million passwords were recently compromised when hackers ran a sniffer program which captured this information as people sent messages around the internet. You don't really know whether or not uh, a hacker who's trying to break into your system is just poking around or is actually trying to do something malicious or actually steal data. You don't have any sense for what their intent is and therefore you have to assume the worst of all the attacks. This, has a, uh, a serious, this causes a serious problem because you may have a large volume of relatively simple attacks that camouflage a few very sophisticated people who are out there trying to uh, engage in uh, you know, industrial espionage, etc. They may have seen me, they may not have seen me. So, what I'm going to do is try and hide my tracks. It looks like I've logged in three times. Okay, each time I'm going to eliminate one occurrence of the login. This hacker hides his tracks without raising an alarm. I'm no longer logged into the system, even though I'm still on the system. The system does not see me. I'm invisible. Now I can proceed to break in or do whatever I want to do. First, I'm going to remove the system cracking tools. If you leave lockpicks lying around, they're going to suspect somebody's been picking locks. Corporate information is power and money, and its acquisition is rising in value in this new era of information warfare. But if a dedicated adversary really wanted to damage America, he would attack the electronic infrastructure, all of which is controlled by computers. I would try to attack the financial systems, either through Wall Street or perhaps through the Federal Reserve Board or the SWIFT network. I would go after transportation facilities, shutting down airlines and other major transportation routes. And I would also go after communication systems, whether they're cellular or land-based telephone companies. If I could, as a bad guy, bring those systems to a halt or severely hamper their operation on a daily basis, the economy of this country, upon a sustained attack, would definitely suffer. modern terrorist can do more damage with a keyboard and a computer than he can do with a gun or a bomb. 
Unless we do something about security on a national scale, I fear that we're going to face something of a computer Chernobyl. at 11 